Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thanks so much for joining this session. Um, today we're going to talk about ecosystem restoration, um, which perhaps in our view is the next frontier of um, environmental investing. So we're going to talk about um, in this session what it is, how you can participate in it from an investment standing, um, some of the key challenges to investing and, and also some of the opportunities that are inherent in this space. This is what we'll be covering during the session, um, but broadly speaking, we'll spend probably an hour or so discussing some of these key sub-themes. Um, if you'd like to participate and raise a hand, then please do so. There's you know, an, an intimate crowd in here today, um, online as well. Um, and then we'll spend the remaining 30 minutes if you have any questions um, with a Q&A style session. Before I go any further, I'll just clarify that I'm coming at this from more of um, an equities angle. Um, I will talk about other sort of assets that you can access this space. Um, but equities is really my area of thought at the moment. And so um, hence the, the presentation will be a little bit biased towards that. Um, and to introduce myself, my name is Gabrielle Kinder. I am an investment and environmental analyst in BMP Paribas Asset Management. I sit within the Fundamental Active Equities team in London, usually, and I'm part of this team, and we have a number of products that um, invest actively within the environmental space. I'd say half of our time is dedicated to decarbonization technologies, and the other half is dedicated to um, technologies which are there to sustain natural capital, which is really some of the newer frontier and the newer technologies that we're looking into um, and something that's quite exciting and, and new. Um, to just give a bit of an introduction to the house that we sit within, BNP Paribas Asset Management, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a French-based um, asset manager with over 500 billion euros of assets globally. Um, it's strong in macro, naturally, being French, which is um, really good in a, in a year like this year. Um, and its other key capability is sustainability, which it's been meaningfully contributing to now for over two decades, with the first launch of its Sustainable um, Responsible um, Investment Fund, or SRI, in 2002. And here's just a timeline of other sustainability accolades as it's built out its capabilities in this space. Um, I'll just highlight the stuff in blue over to the top right. That's um, really been a key milestone and um, strategic pillar for us recently is biodiversity. And so um, hence the sustainability center, which sits behind lots of these achievements. And that's a sustainability center that sits within BNP Paribas Asset Management, about 28 individuals that um, are full-time dedicated to helping investment teams like ours navigate the sustainability landscape. They sit behind a lot of these achievements and really help us in terms of um, understanding what some of the key opportunities are in biodiversity. So I just wanted to emphasize that the um, thoughts that I'm presenting today and sharing with you today are a joint effort between our work and our team and also um, the biodiversity capabilities within the sustainability center. My background um, is in environmental science and biosciences, hence I've got a natural interest in the ecosystem restoration space, um, although I've spent my entire career to date in um, the finance industry. Um, and before we go into the opportunity set for investing in ecosystem restoration, I just wanted to start from the top and go back to basics with what is natural capital? Natural capital, you can think of it as the stock of all of our natural resources, um, on the planet. So think water, fluvial systems, rivers, oceans, um, the um, lands, the forests, crops, anything that's living, so animals, plants, stuff that's invisible but highly important like microbes, and also um, our aerial um, stock as well, so the atmosphere and the biosphere. Um, it's pretty important, as you might guess, um, but we're still understanding the importance of it today um, because we're still trying to um, put a monetary value against nature in order to understand how it works in part of our economy. And so the literature increasingly, um, actually more commercial stakeholders as well, um, are beginning to put a dollar value next to nature. And they're calling these, eco these benefits that nature brings us ecosystem services. That's the official lingo. 
And um, they, they, there's lots of the obvious ones that you probably think of at the top of your head as things that bring us value in our economy are things that you extract from nature, so water, food, forest, timber. Um, it also has a lot of um, benefits in terms of regulating um, the climate. So where I sit in London, we would be probably under six feet of snow if it wasn't for these intricate natural balances, these currents in the ocean, bringing warmer air. So um, there's a lot of hidden ways that nature and the balance that it sits within is very, very important for um, the way that we live and our economy and our supply chains today. Um, likewise, it's important in engineering. We get a lot of our ideas and our extracts from, from nature, um, genetics, um, lots of medicine, pharmacy. And the overall economic value is estimated to be about 44 trillion, and that's direct dependencies on nature, um, which is about more than 50% of our global GDP. So we're beginning to understand a little bit more about the economic advantages of keeping this natural balance, um, this natural ecosystem in balance. Um, and it's also um, a sort of a, an underpinning theme that's the connective tissue between lots of other things which are front of mind and global issues that are front of mind today. Um, so we have COVID, for example, which is exacerbated by you know, zoonotic diseases and, and disregard of nature. Um, recessions coming, climate change, for example, 25% of global um, carbon emissions are released from the degradation of nature. So that's the land use change, changing things to crops and releasing all the organic matter which is in our soils. It's also um, the deforestation of the kind of the lungs of our planet like the Amazon. Amazon rainforest, for example, is admitting more carbon emissions today than it's actually sequestering. So it's now no longer the lungs on net. And so these are, these are some of the, the issues that biodiversity is really underpinning. And, um, and this, is, this is rising up the economic agenda and the political agenda as well. And that's why I'm bringing this theme to you today, because nature's always been around, but it's the awareness of it that's coming up this agenda that's really making an interesting opportunity from an investment perspective now rather than in previous decades. So what is the investment opportunity? Um, succinctly, it's investing in technologies that bring us to a nature positive economy. And to put some numbers on that, the UN is um, wanting us to be nature positive by middle of the century. So that's zero by 2050. Something that's more relevant for us in the room, probably, and more um, relevant for our investment horizons um, are the interim goals. So I'll talk about those as in this presentation more than the 2050. And the, inter the intermediate goals are 30% of nature must be conserved by 2030. And that's within the next eight years. And it's something that's the focus of our research, and that's what helps us to guide some of our economic modeling. And should we reach this target, it would present a major shift in our economy. The way that we extract things, the way that we manufacture things, the supply chain. Um, and so it's, um, it's really constituting a huge shift that could cause um, a lot of losers and laggards, and we'll also see a lot of winners. And some of those winners may be things in sustainable agriculture, in precision agriculture, um, things in alternative chemicals, the way that we um, perhaps do fishery inland, um, the way that we can um, stack crops, the way that we can introduce alternatives to pesticides, things like this. Um, and, and these are some of the um, technologies which are really set to disrupt the market. So we are now understand in brief what the opportunity is in terms of investing in ecosystem restorations. But I want to dedicate the next 10 or so minutes um, focusing on, is it um, an investable theme? And to answer that question, we can look to a theme which is a uh, key to the area that I work in, and that's the energy transition. The energy transition really blew up, I'd say, probably a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the products that I work on is an energy transition fund that invests in the environmental solutions to help decarbonize our economy and bring it to net zero. So it invests in lots of the um, uh, renewables, solar, wind, geothermal. 
It also invests in electric vehicles, things to decarbonize other sectors like transport, circular economy, things like this. And we launched that fund mid-year 2019, and by the beginning of 2020, we had 34% of emissions globally had some kind of a net zero target attached to them. So we were lucky with the timing of the fund. Um, a lot of governments and corporates, big corporates like Amazon and Facebook, committed to becoming net zero. And zero is not a big number. It leaves no room for error. And it's not just our electrifying easy things like electrons, which can be replaced easily with solar and wind. It's also fuels and, and things in harder to abate sectors like aviation or shipping. So that was a really cool um, milestone in, in my career um, to see that happening. And um, within the same year, at the end of the year, we had over, over half of emissions globally had um, a net zero target hanging over them. And the theme blew up in a good way. Um, the passive indices tracking the space were up 100%. Our fund in particular was up 167% within the year. And so this gives us an indication of, is natural capital um, a, an investable theme? We think that if it follows some of the trajectory that the energy transition has followed, then yes, it could be. We're now standing at a point where almost all emissions globally have a CO2 emission net zero target hanging over them. So to make this, um, to see if this is these kind of assumptions apply to the natural capital space, um, we need to see why the energy transition hit like it did and picked up like it did. And one of the main reasons was um, not people doing the ethical thing, the right thing for the planet. It was because of a tipping point in economics where essentially low carbon technologies became cheaper than conventional technologies. And we had the LC LCOEs or the levelized cost of electricity from solar or from wind becoming much, much lower than fossils. And this was before the gas prices blew up. Um, and so the question then begs, um, what is the, uh, are those, are we going to see the same tipping point economically in natural capital? And to answer that question, it's, it's good to really go back to basics and look at the supply and demand of nature. And this is a diagram from um, the IPBES, which is the main thought group for um, ecosystem restoration. And they are tracking um, the supply of nature and the stocks of it. It's in massive demand. We know that just through the fact that population is growing um, and it's also increasing in wealth. And so therefore, um, and because the population centers that where we have the higher growth is in places with high dependencies on nature, then we've got a lot of demand upon it. But perhaps the steeper gradient of change is on the supply side of things, because we're seeing huge degradation in the amount of nature stocks that we have available, that's both terrestrial and aquatic. And the IPBES have mentioned that the decline is around 47% since that that we've had on record, which doesn't come as a surprise. Man has altered you know, most of the land that we have. Um, we use a lot of it for agriculture, for crops. Um, Amazon is standing at 50% of the size of once it was. was. Um, for those natural spaces that still do exist, um, they're subject to a lot of pollution, degradation, exploitation, over-extraction. So we have a huge supply constraint issue. If you put the, the supply and the demand together, you arrive at the um, yellow line down here, which is essentially the amount of natural capital per person on the planet. And it's reduced by 40% in the last 30 years. Put another way, Global Overshoot Day, which is something I just learned about, which is apparently the amount of natural capital used up within a year that the Earth can replace, this year landed on the 28th of July. And that becomes earlier and earlier every single year. Um, with COVID being an exception, that was a little green year. Um, because, and, and, and we, saw, we saw the outputs of that. Venice, you know, the, the, the rivers were blue. 
Um, I'm not sure about you, but I was woken up by birdsong at 5 a.m. during that year um, because nature really started to recover, because we started using it less, because industry collapsed and we had supply chains not extracting as much. So because nature is becoming an increasingly scarce resource, it's rising in value, which means the cost-benefit analysis of reversing degradation of nature is beginning to weigh more heavily in favor of restoration and those technologies which are there to preserve our natural capital. And there are a lot of um, scientists and um, businesses that are starting to try and use ecosystem services methodologies to look at the monetary value of sustaining our nature rather than exploiting it. Um, and they're seeing that, for, for example, in the case of mountains and forests, for every dollar invested in restoring degraded forests, would create seven to $30 of benefit. Now, obviously, the person that's restoring that, that forest isn't going to reap all of the reward, and some of these are knock-ons, but we're seeing, we're seeing trends in the space, which are increasing the amount of revenue that somebody that's managing something sustainably can get. And we'll come to those later, but the voluntary carbon market is something that's really interesting in terms of the side revenue. So we've looked at the economics and how the economics are changing and weighing more in favor of sustaining nature. There's also a bit of a rush on for this as well because a lot of farmers and agriculture and a lot of um, companies and supply chains which are relying on raw materials are seeing that the end is actually in sight. So we've predicted about 50 harvests left until all of the topsoil is gone. We uh, currently degraded our topsoil by 30%, and that's basically an organic layer that sits on the top of the soil. It's where all the good stuff, all the microbes, the stuff that helps crops grow is reducing. And if we continue at the rate that we're doing, um, that will be reduced by 90% by 2050, and we'll really struggle to grow crops in the natural, conventional way. So apart from the economics and apart from the rush that we're in, what are some of the other structural tailwinds which are supporting the case for environmental technologies that are there to help natural capital? Government support is one of them um, coming from the top. And here's a graph that's showing the sort of the rapid onset of biodiversity policies um, across the world. Corporate ambition is following that, um, which is really linked to consumer awareness as well. And um, I, I love this chart. This is from Pew Research Center, and I love it for two reasons. The first is that um, it shows that we're over 50%. We've crossed that boundary into a majority of people think that environmental remediation should be a governmental priority. The second reason that I love it is that it was surveying Americans. And not to be a proud European, but Americans tend to statistically come a few years behind the European space because I couldn't find a global study. Um, and, and that's really important, that 50% threshold, because that's what you need to pass anything through the, um, the, the, the governmental system in the US, as we have seen recently with the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was there for a lot of environmental technologies, providing a lot of subsidy. Um, they finally got that 51% majority that they needed. Um, and um, as such, it's the environmental space has really profited since that. We also have, um, that is really pushing and applying a lot of pressure to corporates, and corporates are doing a lot in terms of reducing their environmental footprint. In the net zero world, there's been a huge amount of rush around that, um, and we've seen most of the top Fortune 500 have now got some kind of a CO2 target that they placed upon their company and committed to publicly and are making themselves accountable to that. And that's the top bar of the corporate ambition box. Biodiversity targets are the bars underneath that, and there's no one way to measure biodiversity, so it's split up. And they're following in suit as well. And we're probably seeing that that's going to increase a lot recently because for every carbon-related regulatory um, target, there's now opening up a natural capital-related version of. So for the TCFD, which is for carbon, we've now got the TNFD. For climate action, we have 
nature action, and this is really going to force a lot of environmental reporting to consider biodiversity. A lot of companies are going to have to be considering what their impact of biodiversity and natural capital is, and basically making sure that their business models, should they be linear, need to be more circular over time. And the one that's missed from the diagram on the left, which I personally think will be very transformatory into the space, is EU taxonomy for sustainable activities. And that's basically going to say, OK, for every company, you have this much revenue aligned to something that's there to help the environment. And the EU taxonomy is split into six pillars. The first two are in force today, and they are relate to climate change and climate mitigation. And the second four pillars are all related to natural capital, whether it's about the water systems, the food systems, pollution, and circular economy. And this is a legislation, so you have to report on this. Companies will be reporting on this in the EU over a certain size. They've also recently passed that companies that are dealing into the EU zone are going to have to report on this. That's even in American companies that have operations in the EU will have to disclose how much revenue they have that is either supporting or detracting from our natural capital. And in the finance industry where I sit, we are going to be legally obligated to ask our clients what sustainability preferences that they have alongside with their risk appetite and the returns appetite, which we already have to, and answer them with how much of our portfolio is aligned to their sustainability preferences. So this piece of regulation um, really has the power to be quite transformatory in this space. Um, going back to the structural tailwind slide, we also have um, a piece on climate change. And I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes explaining that because it's not always so obvious. Nature and climate change are very intrinsically linked. Nature, if degraded, will release a lot of carbon emissions into the atmosphere, currently 25%, as you can see from here. But if it's um, preserved, can actually really help us towards our net zero targets. In fact, there's very few scientists that think that we can hit our net zero targets without relying on the restoration of our ecosystems, which meant that all those net zero targets that we talked about earlier, the 89% of emissions globally that need to be zeroed, will need to put a lot of fire and a lot of thought and, and, and attention to um, the degradation of our ecosystems, which are going to need to also go to zero. And last but not least, and something that's probably more in the public space this year than it has been on previous years, and that's the independence of our economic systems. We've had, um, and this graph shows Repower EU, which is a policy for those of you that don't know, which essentially for the Europeans to replace their um, Russian gas. It's to wean us off the Russian gas, which has really been weaponized in recent times. And we're having the same independence and um, sorry, security concerns for lots of other supply chains too. And this is really important, especially for um, sub-themes like food, where crops are really under pressure. A lot of the sort of equatorial crop regions are becoming harder and harder to farm in because of droughts and overheating. And also on the more sort of poleward side of things um, towards the north and the south, and we're also having a lot of pathogens and pests that can now exist there that couldn't previously. Um, pathogens are moving polewards as the, as the earth heats up and it's close to their set point. And so that means that our crops are really, um, are really struggling in terms of pesticides. We're throwing more pesticides, the pollution increases. It's, it's a negative and reinforcing circle. And we've seen with COVID and we've seen with Russia that when things get tough and supplies under constraints, it's every country for itself. And um, so now food security is really going up the chain of concerns for governments. Um, we've just seen Ian, um, Hurricane Ian wipe out lots of the southeast um, US crop fields recently. And that will, that will really hinder their harvests going forwards as well. And so this has been um, a big piece in terms of the um, political arena. So overall, the technology opportunity for um, technologies which help get us to nature positive is about 22 trillion, as estimated by the World Economic Forum, with an extra 6 trillion of annual business opportunities. Um, and we, we essentially, it's our 
hypothesis, if you like, for our team, that this set of technologies, because of the sheer force of structural tailwinds behind them and the rush at which we need to roll these out, will probably outperform the broader markets over time, the broader equity markets. So that's our hypothesis. The next question is, how can you access this theme from an investing standing? And the way that we've segmented it quite simply um, in our team is looking at technologies which are there to sustain ocean and water systems, terrestrial ecosystems like land, food and forestry, and also our sustainable cities and buildings, because in urban centres that's where we're putting the most pressure on natural capital. And there's loads of very interesting technologies that um, sit within these areas, and I'll just go through a few now to give you some concrete examples. On the agricultural side of things, and that's probably one of the areas and the verticals that will be disrupted the most from the transition to a biodiversity positive economy, is um, controlled greenhouses and vertical farming. And also that what sits inside here, this box as well, is precision agriculture. So we're investing in a bunch of very exciting technologies that essentially take open field farming indoors, stack it up vertically so that you're having a huge, a, a much larger yield, up to 30 times the yield per square foot, and making sure that the entire ecosystem is enclosed. And that's good in terms of the environment because it means that um, water can be recycled and these companies are using 90% water. They capture it on their roofs and then they recycle it. All the evapotranspiration from the plant is captured, recycled back in. The same thing for um, pesticides, they're not needed because it's inside. Um, for fertilizers, they use a lot less, and again, they're recycled. And they can also be um, sort of put closer to the point that they're needed, so closer to their use case, and therefore um, less emissions used in, in traveling. So they're very, they're very exciting. Um, are they... Um, is the cost of growing a tomato in a vertical farm as cheap as growing it open in, in sort of open farming? N um, no, it's probably more expensive to do in a vertical farm, but it's a lot more resilient. So we'll probably find that further down the road, when we have more Hurricane Ians come along, um, and we've got that increasing degradation and lack of ability to um, grow crops, and we're seeing that the yields are decreasing, then it's these vertical farms that are shielded from a lot of the um, climate change and a lot of the variable weather patterns we're seeing. These are the ones that are going to win out. And they're also protected from those crop pathogens, which are increasing polewoods, as we said. The other interesting area are field sensors and satellite data. This is less relevant to vertical farming, but it's more important to open farming. And doing that, it's still possible to do it in a way that's in restorative fashion. So restorative agriculture is um, doing things such as no-till farming. It's churning the soils less. We invest in all the technologies that help farmers do this, the new harvesters. They keep things in situ so that the, the, the soil, the topsoil can, can grow over time. And with that, that means that rather than drying out their fields, they're actually increasing the organic matter in the field. And when you increase the organic matter and you increase the topsoil, you're sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. And this is important because carbon is now one of the most lucrative commodities that we have. We invest in um, sort of derivatives for EU ETS, for example, which is the European carbon market. And the carbon price, for those of you that track it, has just gone from strength to strength. It's increased three times in about the last five years. And the great thing about restorative agriculture is that you can start to quantify how much carbon your farm or your fields is sequestering through these sort of IoT sensors and satellite data, which can pick up how much um, biomass is in a certain land through spectral imaging, and then it can say, this is how much carbon you lay down and you remove from the atmosphere. Then the farmer can then sell that as a carbon credit. A company like Netflix or Amazon that's trying to reduce their carbon emissions and buy offsets can buy that carbon credit from the farmer and you have a nice revenue stream for being restorative. 
So these are the kind of business models which are starting to pick up, and we're starting to see a lot of... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively disaggregated market at the moment, but it's becoming more centralised and it's becoming more regulated. And there's a lot of talk of making this a voluntary carbon offset market that's currently happening, um, involuntary, like the um, carbon market for the EU ETS that we currently have today. Other things that we're looking into, mRNA. So this is about um, substitutions for chemicals. And you can invest in these type of companies really across the market cap spectrum. So lots of the technologies that I'm talking about today, they're not rinky-dink, tiny companies. Some of them are huge. So one of the main companies in this space is Novozymes. And for a long time, starting with biological washing detergents, they removed chemicals from the system and they replaced them with biological alternatives like enzymes that can be produced naturally and also they break down naturally and they don't pollute and leach out into systems and bioaccumulate and become toxins in the food chains over time. And then you also have smaller players in the market. So one that we've invested in recently, which is really interesting and it's the, the key um, sort of piece in the title, is an mRNA company. And you might be familiar with mRNA from our COVID vaccines. And essentially helps inoculate us with the resistance against COVID. You can do the same with plants as well. So you can inoculate plants with a certain resistance. And like COVID, it's in the system. It breaks down in 48 hours. So it's, um, you need sort of a teaspoon of this to supply an entire field. And it will break down in 48 hours and essentially equips the plant with um, that little bit of genetic code that it needs to protect itself. It's something that already happens in nature because as plants evolve, they do this, but it's speeding up the process. And this means that you can be really targeted about what you, um, what you want to remove from your field. So if you're a farmer in Colorado and you're suffering with the Colorado potato beetle, which is, um, which is a pest in that region, then you can use the mRNA insecticide to, to target that and remove it from your fields without targeting anything else. Because the issue with insecticides is it will take out everything. It will carpet bomb the entire field, any microbes, the bees, the pollinators, um, the biodiversity, things that help that, that topsoil accumulate, <coughs> it will remove. And this is also a really cost-effective way of protecting your farm because um, insecticides are very expensive for farmers to produce. And they're also tied to volatile markets that are usually subject to inflation. This is looking more at terrestrial ecosystems. So one of the most exploitative industries globally is open water fishing. Um, it's almost entirely unregulated because it's very difficult to regulate ships that are far, far off and usually traveling um, so for weeks at a time. And that is um, causing a lot of issues in terms of overfishing. So the target species are reduced and, and, and fish stocks have gone down dramatically. And we've seen the extinction of about a quarter of fish stocks globally. So um, it, we've got a mass um, extinction problem in sea. And we also have um, issues with bycatch as well. So even when you target your fish and you cast your net, you usually catch a lot of other species that you don't mean to, um, dolphins, turtles, and less cute things as well. Um, and, and they end up dying in the process, and they're usually thrown back overboard, and it's not regulated. And so um, a lot of the new business models in terms of restorative ways of doing aquaculture is to bring things inland. And so we've got a lot of inland aquaculture companies that we're investing in. And what they can do is make sure that you reduce any overfishing because you know exactly what you're growing and you grow it yourself. There's, it eliminates bycatch entirely. And again, it uses sensors and ways to monitor that the fish are getting what they need. A lot of open water fisheries, they put a lot of antibiotics into the water to help the, you know, sort of resist, um, increase the resistance of the fish. Um, that's not needed when you're bringing things inland, so it's reducing costs as well. And as things like the um, Intergovernmental Marine Organization or the IMO increase the cost for shipping, 
because they're essentially saying that you need to now pay for the carbon that you pollute within shipping. They're also expressing um, needs that you need to equip your ships with e-batteries, with um, fuel alternatives. A lot of environmental measures are increasing the cost of shipping, and we've seen cost of shipping increase dramatically over the last two years, that these inland fisheries are becoming more and more competitive. And the last thing is um, sort of water management. And some of the interesting um, technologies around here are using things like biological cleansers and enzymes to remove water, um, sort of impurities in water, um, and, and recycle this. And recycling in, um, in a lot of developed companies for water is really increasing. Um, and there's, again, a range of small technologies and small companies and challenges that are in this space. You obviously have the big companies that are doing this very well, like Veolia. Recycling is the last thing here, um, and that's really technologies to turn our very linear economy circular. Um, we've got a big focus on plastic at the moment because plastic recycling is only 16% circular, and the rest of it's wasted, um, and it's increasing in usage. And these these companies are quite interesting from an investment standing because the waste, the feedstocks for um, a recycling plastic company um, are really cheap because it's other people's waste. And at the same time, when they recycle them, they usually sell them for a premium. So Coca-Cola, for example, um, wants 100% recycled plastic, and they will pay their suppliers of plastic recycling a premium for those products. And so from an investment standing, this is a really interesting place to be. Um, and we're, saying, we're seeing that the recycling plants, which can either be mechanical or chemical, are very much in de demand, and they're the um, bottleneck in supply. Investing in this space doesn't come without its challenges, though. And so I'll talk you through the challenges and the advantages. One of the challenges is, is um, short-term volatility. And that's because a lot of the companies in this space tend to be quite new, quite growthy, quite interest rate sensitive. And they also have a lot of um, supply chains and supply chain based companies can be affected by various external factors, which means that some of our volatility in some of the um, passive indices, which best characterize the space, which I probably say is these three indices, um, global ag tech, and then some clean energy environmental technology company um, indices have volatilities of between 26% and 50%. So um, they oscillate a lot. And therefore, um, investors which have that three to five year time horizon that are investing through cycle are the ones that come to us. Um, that the ones that are convinced on the macroeconomics, um, the macroeconomic space, um, and the ones that are thinking that the structural tailwinds for this space um, probably outnumber any other, those are the ones that are attracted to the funds that we run, like ecosystem restoration. So that's one of the key challenges. We have um, you know, a dedicated PhD quant, for example, that helps optimize the portfolio. So obviously our fund has volatility lower than this, um, and that's because we can do some things by actively trading. Um, but that is the area that we are aligned to. Um, is a very dynamic space. It also has a lot of nascent technologies and new markets. And they're sometimes difficult to work with because usually when you're doing a discount cash flow model, you begin with the market. But if the market's not really there, then it's a little bit more difficult to work with. And we also see that a lot of sell side and a lot of price valuations for these companies are using valuations and market address a total addressable markets, which are much lower than our own models. And we usually see that that's because um, historically, and you don't even have to look that far back in history, actually, um, that most experts in their field um, tend to underestimate the adoption of new technologies. So in the middle, you have a graph here that's the International Energy Agency. And um, this is their, it's probably a bit small to see, actually. Um, but this is the adoption forecast for renewables, the penetration of renewables into grids that they forecasted over time. And the flat lines um, are its early felt forecasts in the 1990s, and they were almost flat. Now they're 45 degree angles, um, and that's probably a massive underestimation of the reality. 
The same thing for electric vehicles a few years later. And if I went back through almost any technology that's big today, so radios, microwaves, smartphones, um, they've all been underestimated in terms of the rollout and the speed at which this can happen, especially when you get themes like ecosystem restoration where everybody's acting together. It's quite rare that you have a theme where what people want and what consumers want is also what the government wants and is also what's economically viable. So um, it, it's, it's these types of tailwinds that can really um, speed things up beyond what even analysts in the area expect. And this is partly because when things scale so quickly, you get these learning rates. And this is essentially the decrease in the cost of energy, for example, in renewables that are coming down over time. Um, and they were extremely steep, and they were much steeper than we expected. To help um, sort of navigate that challenge with new markets, what we do is a lot of bespoke modeling. And we also have um, only equity analysts in the space which have previous experience with these technologies. It's quite overwhelming, the amount of technologies that are in this space and popping up. And it's also one of those spaces which is massively um, a victim of greenwashing. So somebody to cut through and understand superior from inferior um, is really needed. So um, we've got chemists on the team, um, a lot of environmental um, scientists, and also um, people that invested in only sustainability technologies throughout their career. Um, the advantages of investing in the theme, on top of the fact that we believe it's a theme that will outperform the market over time, is the fact that it's a natural diversification opportunity because it affects most verticals, turning from a linear economy to circular. You also have um, the unparalleled structural tailwinds and also the nice dual return aspect that if this is a financial return and it's sort of that's the first and foremost and primary objective of our fund. Um, but you also get an environmental return as well alongside. Obviously, understanding what our environmental impact is a difficult one, and it's something that we have a lot of questions of um, as a sort of a fund manager in this space is, how do you quantify your biodiversity impact through the products that you invest in? And that's just something I wanted to spend the last five minutes covering today. Um, because it's something that we've grappled with over the, the last couple of years or so. And we split it up into um, sort of a mosaic approach, as biodiversity doesn't have a one-size-fits-all metric, unlike decarbonization, where everything uses in decarbonization the humble CO2E. Um, e stands for equivalent, so basically even a greenhouse gas like methane, which is four times the global warming ability of CO2, is essentially counts four times a CO2 molecule, and everything's normalized back to the CO2e in that way. We don't have that nice tidy metric for biodiversity because um, it's so diffuse and it's so variable. And so the only way that we found to look at it is look at it through different perspectives and build up those perspectives in our environmental reporting. So it's like looking at um, a house, for example. To appreciate a house, you can't just look at the floor plan. You need to look at it from different dimensions, um, a 4D perspective. And that's the layers that we have in our report. The first is looking at the footprint of the, um, of the portfolio. So this is the dependencies it has on nature. This is a study which is done by Iceberg Data Labs. Um, which are very good at understanding your dependencies on ecosystem services. And this is actually at the asset manager level. So this is BMP Paribas Asset Management as a whole, their dependencies on our ecosystem services. So we just need to be aware when investing that we have a huge dependency on terrestrial ecosystems. And we can compare this with our MSCI ACWI index and basically say, do we depend less on nature? Do we take less from nature? than perhaps an equivalent investment in um, a broad-based equity index like the MSE Acqui or the NASDAQ. We also look at the revenues of our portfolios and where they're directed. So we have um, a lot of green revenue, and we, we um, sort of contrast that with the gray revenue, stuff that's not really doing anything. We invest in a lot of pure play companies, but also to get the um, sort of bring the volatility down um, and in make sure that our diversification and um, our portfolio is hitting 
the risk appetite that we have. We also invest in a lot of established companies that are very much up the market cap spectrum, like the Veolias, the Trimbles, um, and sort of the Novozymes of the world. So we look at that. Um, and also try and bring to our investors where we're investing a lot of our money. So a lot of it at this time when we took the readings was invested in um, sort of restoration of farming. And that was because we just had a soft commodities rally at the time. And so we had a lot of farmers that had big cash flows. And so that was a really lucrative space to bend into and lean into at the time. Um, but we try and give that breakdown and give the flavor of where we're driving impact as a portfolio to our clients. And we also did some bottom-up data analysis as well. So this was quite fun. Um, and it was basically we, realizing that there was no biodiversity impact. We just decided to go to each of our companies and say, what it is that you do, where's your impact? Um, and we did that to all of the companies in the portfolio. And then we looked at the raw data. We performed a cluster analysis. And we saw where the trends were. And at the time that we took this reading, um, we had, as I mentioned, um, a big cluster and a big trend um, or theme that came out of the portfolio was a lot of our companies were restoring ecosystems. And the chart on the left shows you the ecosystems that they're restoring. So we had Sumitomo, for example, which is um, one of the only sustainable forestry companies globally. Um, a number of other companies that were restoring you know, boreal forests, I think that's unsustainably managed rainforests, a company that's working with nature-based funds to essentially accumulate revenue for restoring rather than deforesting forests. And then the other big sub-theme that came out of the portfolio was that a lot of our portfolio were circular economy technologies, and these are the feedstocks that they're recycling that we normalised to put in the same units and then made that available to our clients. For everything that we couldn't fit in a nice box, we just um, sort of put in a mosaic so that clients can get a bit of a taste. Um, there's some a little bit silly ones in there, like five endangered bisons were reintroduced to land. Um, and then we have other sort of more serious ones, like the number of water bottles that were recycled by the companies in our portfolio. Now's an interesting time to um, sort of look into the theme because compared to broad-based equities, um, they're earning a lot more compared to their prices and compared to their books. Um, and peg ratios are looking pretty attractive too. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons that we um, really like this theme and think it's, from an economic standing, pretty attractive. So the conclusions here is that we, um, we consume nature um, almost twice as fast as we regenerate it. Um, as nature becomes increasingly scarce, it becomes more valuable, and therefore the economic advantages of sustaining it rather than exploiting it increase. There are a number of interesting technologies which are lucrative to access this theme from an equity standing. Um, but investing in natural capital um, isn't without its challenges, and, and risk appetites need to be aligned with your long-term goals. With valuations the lowest in, in a period, it's, it's an interesting time to scope out the theme. Um, and there's a lot of innovation happening in terms of the um, number of technologies and the way that we can articulate the impact that we have. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I'll throw it open to um, any questions that you might have. If there are no questions in front of the audience, then I'm sticking around for the next half an hour. So um, you can kind of approach me one to one. Oh, one question. Yep. Uh, hi there. Hi, Paul Clements Hunt from uh, uh, the Blended Capital Group um, based in Nairobi. Um, it looked fascinating, wonderful, wonderful uh, sweep through the, the opportunities. Um, just one question in terms of channeling or flowing uh, finance and capital to, to really interesting com companies in the least developed countries, in the, the lower middle income countries perhaps, where you know, there's that immediate risk sort of um, profile given, but those companies were sort of converging you know, digital AI, machine learning with delivery of solutions to the last mile uh, in, in, that, in that context. Um, and just as a, a sort of underpinning there, we've just moved a, a holding we've had in Kenya 
in Western Kenya for, for eight years. After two years of discussion into, I guess, the gateway to Amazonia, and it's through and with uh, last mile sort of development of serv or provision of services to communities there. It is a for-profit company. Um, but, you know, the, the actual investors in and around that space are few and far between once you bring in the sort of the, the risk profile of, of the, the less developed economies. Any views on that would be helpful in terms of how you as a major financial institution could, could look to channel into those type of really edgy, innovative companies who are delivering, but they're always on the back foot when they're looking for either equity or debt. Yeah, it's a difficult one um, because I would say that emerging markets is um, sort of the edge of environmental investing. Ecosystem restoration technologies are also the edge of environmental investing. So if you put the two together, it's like investing in the edge of the edge, which is very new age technologies with very, very nascent and very young companies. So at the moment, um, because of how nascent this space is, I'd say 95% of the portfolio that we have is currently in developed markets. And we've got a few exceptions. So a lot of it's around forestry where we're seeing a lot of the money come in. And that's because of the linkages to um, the voluntary carbon market and how people can now say, I'm looking after this tree and I'll continue looking after this tree as long as you pay me to look after the tree. And so we've got a number of companies in Indonesia and South America um, which are trying to reverse the deforestation trends. Um, in terms of other technologies, um, we're not seeing those in terms of the listed space. We're tracking a number of companies in the private space that when they come to, um, come to market, then we, we, we might participate. Um, but yes, it is challenging. And we have an emerging markets fund, which is looking at climate solutions of all types, um, both decarbonization and ecosystem restoration. Um, but we're finding that the majority of um, lucrative opportunities that are attractive from investment standing in that fund are actually on the decarbonizing side. Let me uh, push back a little bit. I, I, what you say is completely rational, I understand it. But I think there is, there is there, there's some really interesting leapfrogging companies at the forefront of the sustainability channels, cha challenges, whether it's in Africa or it's in LATAM or uh, Southeast Asia. And I genuinely think that um, you know, investors, investors of any shape or size are missing those opportunities. And I understand it. it's really hard to dig into those countries and find you know, sort of edgy entrepreneurs who are uh, super smart, pulling in the technologies, delivering solutions, particularly in the agri and the food system space. But th there is a massive gap, and I just think that actually you know, there needs to be harder work done, as good as your work is, but by big financial institutions to fish out those opportunities. I, I mean, in many ways, I completely agree. Hello, uh, I'm Gregory Hess, uh, CEO of Tree Global. Um, we are just following up on Paul Clements Hunt's uh, comments. Uh, we're probably the largest uh, landscape uh, restorer in Africa. The, the biggest challenge is uh, on the curve of removals, we're at the very start of the whole curve, and in real ecosystem restoration, there's a huge disconnect between the scale and the urgency of the challenge and the financing mechanisms that are uh, available and that are being offered uh, to investment markets. Um, to what extent have you looked at alternative uh, finance mechanisms. For example, in our case, we've just closed a $400 million uh, streaming agreement uh, covering a million and a half hectares in Africa to restore for carbon biodiversity and ecosystem uh, credits. But there's no way that this could be financed by traditional uh, debt or equity or fund like with, with, with time limited uh, returns. So to what extent have you looked at alternative financing mechanisms to really match to what that 20% that, that of the global carbon market needs to, to drive scale? Um, yeah, so probably to a small extent, really, is my honest answer. Um, because we are looking at this from an equity space, and you know, I, I did put the disclaimer at the beginning that this was going to be an equity-biased presentation, um, then no, we haven't done much. Do I agree that you could access this space through other assets as well? 100%. I think that a multi-asset type 
fund would be a really interesting way to um, exploit all of the opportunities through um, through bonds, through yeah alternative finance, through the private market, through the listed market. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Hi, <clears throat> I'm happy to see that actually buying Bay Paribas is caring about nature restoration because you know it had a very big corporation headquartered worldwide in Switzerland. Number one was num providing number one finance um, to the oil trading, fossil trading. Actually it closed because there was a big scandal. It avoided sanctions and it had to pay over 10 billion fine to the US Treasury. So it's good that now you're trying to, well, do something maybe positive. Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, you're laughing. It's not, it's not fun, sorry, it's not fun. Now, um, just one I want to ask you is, um, I mean, you're basically in asset management. Uh, so you mostly do this through fund, publicly uh, traded funds, or you work a lot with uh, institutional and you help them to structure or maybe some philanthropic organizations. And if you can say what amount, actually do you work with your own structured finance department, as the gentleman said, to help you know, maybe uh, do some investments. And does BNP Paribas put part of its own equity, which is enormous in this? And uh, also, what amount you have under management and what are your objectives? Thank you. Okay, so in terms of the amount under management for- Actually, it's not funny. You were laughing at those, you know, the fossil financing was really not funny. Working with, by the way, sanctions with Iran, you know, and it was done for many, many years. I think there's nothing to laugh, sorry. No, I agree. It's, it's about uh, attitude. No, no, you were laughing. Look, even now you're laughing. Sorry. Um, okay, no. so I've dedicated my entire career and my educational background to climate change and environmental technologies. Right, but the company which is paying you didn't do this for a long time. Asset management as itself, which is a separate entity, um, is not... So we have exclusion policies against unconventional oil and gas. And personally, in our funds, we don't invest in oil and gas or fossils either. Under um, any company that has more than 10% of revenues derived from oil or gas would not come into um, BNP asset management funds. Um, and we also have a lot of investment in the environmental space, and this has been a really key strategic pillar and an area of focus for us. And asset management, BNP, is also just signed a pledge to become net zero so that we're aligning all of our investments towards net zero, and that target is 2050. So yeah, it's something that we're taking extremely seriously. And from a personal standing, I've dedicated my entire career to it. So yes, I take it very seriously, seriously as well. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so first of all, following up on Gregory's um, question on uh, the asset classes or instruments that, um, that are starting to emerge as the fetus for these kind of uh, investments, I was wondering, um, so if there are specific instruments that, or asset classes that are starting to pop us this would be the fetus, and if that is uh, triggered by the type of projects or by the demands of investors, being an asset manager, um, I'll rephrase the question. Are there opportunities in the demand and or limitations given the demand uh, by investors in terms of what instruments could we put forward? That's one question, and the other one is very uh, small. When you, one of the conclusions was that um, technology uh, was one of the beneficiaries of uh, investment in this transition. And I was wondering, I was speaking about development of technologies that is venture capital type of investment, or is it 
technology through investing in big technology companies, uh, like investing in the stock exchange. Thank you. Yeah, so in answer to your second question, um, it's um, your former suggestion. So technologies which are there as the, the solution providers to help a company like you know, Facebook or Amazon who are trying to reduce their footprint on biodiversity and natural capital is the companies to help enable those companies to transition, if that makes sense. Um, and on your second question, which I believe maybe I should paraphrase this to make sure that I've understood it um, perfectly, that are there other um, asset classes which you can use to access this space? Um, and is it all in VC? Um, no, I'd say the number of companies that are in the VC stage for this space um, do outnumber the number in listed equity markets. Um, but obviously the amount of capital available and, and sort of the available market cap is much greater in listed equities. Um, there's a huge tail of companies that we um, are tracking because in, in our fund, we try and put as much money, you know, within our risk constraints into um, sort of private, sort of public placements. Um, and so that would be participating in pipe, in IPOs, um, and helping anchor investments and bringing them to market. Um, and so for that reason, we, we do track a lot of the private market as well. Um, but yeah, there, there are other structures that you can access this space and all are interesting. Great, um, I'll wrap it up there. And I've been told to tell you that at 4 p.m. you um, can go and mingle and have coffee and network in the lobby. Um, or was it f and then they'll have another sort of new plenary set of plenary um, panels and sessions after that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you.